Northanger Abbey, chapter the 18th. With a mind full of happiness, Catherine was hardly aware that two or three days had passed away without her seeing Isabella for more than a few minutes together. She began first to be sensible of this, and to sigh for her conversation, as she walked along the pump room one morning by Mrs. Allen's side, without anything to say or to hear. And scarcely had she felt a five minutes longing of friendship before the object of it appeared, and inviting her to a secret conference led the way to a seat. This is my favourite place, said she, as they sat down on a bench between the doors, which commanded a tolerable view of everybody entering at either. It is so out of the way. Catherine, observing that Isabella's eyes were continually towards one door or the other, as in eager expectation, and remembering how often she had been falsely accused of being arch, thought to the present a fine opportunity for being really so, and therefore gaily said, Do not be uneasy, Isabella. James will soon be here. Psh! My dear creature, she replied, do not think me such a simpleton as to be always wanting to confine him to my elbow. It would be hideous to be always together. We should be the jest of the place. And so you are going to Northanger. I am amazingly glad of it. It is one of the finest old places in England, I understand. I shall depend upon a most particular description of it. You shall certainly have the best in my power to give. But who are you looking for? Are your sisters coming? I am not looking for anybody. One's eyes must be somewhere, and you know what a foolish trick I have of fixing mine when my thoughts are an hundred miles off. I am amazingly absent. I believe I am the most absent creature in the world. Tilney says it is always the case with minds of a certain stamp. But I thought, Isabella, you had something in particular to tell me. Oh yes, and so I have. But here is a proof of what I was saying. My poor head, I had quite forgot it. Well, the thing is this. I have just had a letter from John. You can guess the contents. No, indeed, I cannot. My sweet love, do not be so abominably affected. What can he write about but yourself? You know he is over head and ears in love with you. With me, dear Isabella? Nay, my sweetest Catherine, this is being quite absurd. Modesty and all that is very well in its way, but really a little common honesty is sometimes quite as becoming. I have no idea of being so overstrained. It is fishing for compliments. His attentions were such as a child must have noticed, and it was but half an hour before he left Bath that you gave him the most positive encouragement. He says so in this letter, says that he is as good as made you an offer, and that you have received his advances in the kindest way, and now he wants me to urge his suit, and say all manner of pretty things to you. So it is in vain to affect ignorance. Catherine, with all the earnestness of truth, expressed her astonishment at such a charge, protesting her innocence of every thought of Mr. Thorpe's being in love with her, and the consequent impossibility of her having ever intended to encourage him. As to any attentions on his side, I do declare upon my honour, I never was sensible of them for a moment except just his asking me to dance the first day of his coming, and as to making me an offer, or anything like it, there must be some unaccountable mistake. I could not have misunderstood a thing of that kind, you know, and as I ever wish to be believed, I solemnly protest that no syllable of such a nature ever passed between us. The last half hour before he went away, it must be all and completely a mistake, for I did not see him once that whole morning. But that you certainly did, for you spent the whole morning in Edgar's buildings. It was the day your father's consent came, and I am pretty sure that you and John were alone in the parlour some time before you left the house. Are you? Well, if you say it, it was so. I dare say. But for the life of me, I cannot recollect it. 
I do not remember being with you and seeing him as well as the rest, but that we were alone for five minutes. However, it is not worth arguing about, for whatever might pass on his side, you must be convinced by my having no recollection of it that I never thought, nor expected, nor wished for anything of the kind from him. I am excessively concerned that he should have any regard for me, but indeed it has been quite unintentional on my side. I never had the smallest idea of it. Pray undeceive him as soon as you can and tell him I beg his pardon. That is... I do not know what I ought to say, but make him understand what I mean in the properest way. I would not speak disrespectfully of a brother of yours, Isabella, I am sure, but you know very well that if I could think of one man more than another, he is not the person. Isabella was silent. My dear friend, you must not be angry with me. I cannot suppose your brother cares so very much about me. And you know, we shall still be sisters. Yes, yes, with a blush. There are more ways than one of being sisters. But where am I wandering to? Well, my dear Catherine, the case seems to be that you are determined against poor John. Is it not so? I certainly cannot return his affection, and as certainly never meant to encourage it. Since that is the case, I am sure I shall not tease you any further. John desired me to speak to you on the subject, and therefore I have. But I confess, as soon as I had read his letter, I thought it a very foolish, imprudent business, and not likely to promote the good of either. For what were you to live upon, supposing you came together? You have both of you something, to be sure, but it is not a trifle that will support a family nowadays, and after all that romances may say, there is no doing without money. I only wonder John could think of it. He could not have received my last. You do acquit me, then, of anything wrong. You are convinced that I never meant to deceive your brother, never suspected him of liking me till this moment. Oh, as to that, answered Isabella laughingly, I do not pretend to determine what your thoughts and designs in times past may have been. All that is best known to yourself. A little harmless flirtation or so will occur, and one is often drawn on to give more encouragement th than one wishes to stand by. But you may be assured that I am the last person in the world to judge you severely. All those things should be allowed for in youth and high spirits. What one means one day, you know, one may mo not mean the next. Circumstances change, opinions alter. But my opinion of your brother never did alter. It was always the same. You are describing what never happened. My dearest Catherine, continued the older, without at all listening to her, I would not for all the world be the means of hurrying you into an engagement before you knew what you were about. I do not think anything would justify me in wishing you to sacrifice all your happiness merely to oblige my brother, because he is my brother, and who, perhaps, after all, you know, might be just as happy without you. For people seldom know what would they would be at, young men especially, they are so amazingly changeable and inconstant. What I say is, why should a brother's happiness be dearer to me than a friend's? You know I carry my notions of friendship pretty high. But above all things, my dear Catherine, do not be in a hurry. Take my word for it that if you are in too great a hurry, you will certainly live to repent it. Tilney says, there is nothing people are so often deceived in as the state of their own affections, and I believe he is very right. Ah, here he comes. Never mind, he will not see us, I am sure. Catherine, looking up, perceived Captain Tilney, and Isabella, earnestly fixing her eye on him as she spoke, soon caught his notice. He approached immediately and took the seat to which her movements invited him. His first address made Catherine start. Though spoken low, she could distinguish. What? Always to be watched? Impersonal by proxy? Psh! Nonsense, was Isabella's answer in the same half-whisper. 
Why do you put such things into my head? If I could believe it, my spirit, you know, is pretty independent. I wish your heart were independent. That would be enough for me. My heart, indeed. What can you have to do with hearts? You men have none of you any hearts. If we have not hearts, we have eyes, and they give us torment enough. Do they? I am sorry for it. I am sorry they find anything so disagreeable in me. I will look another way. I hope this pleases you, turning her back on him. I hope your eyes are not tormented now. <laughs> Never more so, for the edge of a blooming cheek is still in view, at once too much and too little. Catherine heard all this, and quite out of countenance could listen no longer. Amazed that Isabella could endure it, and jealous for her brother, she rose up, and saying she should join Mrs. Allen, proposed their walking. But for this Isabella showed no inclination. She was so amazingly tired, and it was so tedious to parade about the pump room, and if she moved from her seat she would miss her sisters. She was expecting her sisters every moment, so that her dearest Catherine must excuse her, and must sit quietly down again. But Catherine could be stubborn too, and Mrs. Allen just then coming up to propose their returning home, she joined her and walked out of the pump room, leaving Isabella still sitting with Captain Tilney. With much uneasiness did she leave them. It seemed to her that Captain Tilney was falling in love with Isabella, and Isabella unconsciously encouraging him. Unconsciously it must be, for Isabella's attachment to James was as certain and well acknowledged as her engagement. To doubt her truth or good intentions was impossible, and yet, during the whole of their conversation, her manner had been odd. She wished Isabella had talked more like her usual self, and not so much about money, and had not looked quite so well pleased at the sight of Captain Tilney. How strange that she should not perceive his admiration. Catherine longed to give her a hint of it, to put her on her guard, and to prevent all the pain which her too lively behaviour might otherwise create, both for him and her brother. The compliment of John Thorpe's affection did not make amends for this thoughtlessness in his sister. She was almost as far from believing as from wishing it to be sincere. For she had not forgotten that he could mistake, and his assertion of the offer and of her encouragement convinced her that his mistakes could sometimes be very egregious. In vanity, therefore, she gained but little. Her chief profit was in wonder. That he should think it worth his while to fancy himself in love with her was a matter of lively astonishment. Isabella talked of his attentions. She had never been sensible of any. But Isabella had said many things which she hoped had been spoken in haste and would never be said again. And upon this she was glad to rest altogether for present ease and comfort. Northanger Abbey, Chapter the Nineteenth a few days passed away, and Catherine, though not allowing herself to suspect her friend, could not help watching her closely. The result of her observations was not agreeable. Isabella seemed an altered creature. When she saw her indeed surrounded only by their immediate friends in Edgar's buildings or Pulteney Street, her change of manners was so trifling that, had it gone no further, it might have passed unnoticed. A something of languid indifference, or of that boasted absence of mind which Catherine had never heard of before, would occasionally come across her. But had nothing worse appeared, that might only have spread a new grace and inspired a warmer interest. But when Catherine saw her in public, admitting Captain Tilney's attentions as readily as they were offered, and allowing him almost an equal share with James in her notice and smiles, the alteration became too positive to be passed over. What could be meant by such unsteady conduct, what her friend could be at, was be beyond her comprehension. Isabella could not be aware of the pain she was inflicting. But it was a degree of willful thoughtlessness which Catherine could not but resent. James was the sufferer. 
she saw him grave and uneasy, and however careless of his present comfort the woman might be who had given him her heart, to her it was always an object. For poor Captain Tilney, too, she was greatly concerned. Though his looks did not please her, his name was a passport to her goodwill, and she thought with sincere compassion of his approaching disappointment. For in spite of what she had believed herself to overhear in the pump room, his behaviour was so incompatible with the knowledge of Isabella's engagement that she could not, upon reflection, imagine him aware of it. He might be jealous of her brother as a rival, but if more had seemed implied, the fault must have been in her misapprehension. She wished, by a gentle remonstrance, to remind Isabella of her situation and make her aware of this double unkindness. But for remonstrance, either opportunity or comprehension was always against her. If able to suggest a hint, Isabella could never understand it. In this distress, the intended departure of the Tilney family became her chief consolation. Their journey into Gloucestershire was to take place within a few days, and Captain Tilney's removal would at least restore peace to every heart but his own. But Captain Tilney had at present no intention of removing. He was not to be of the party to Northanger. He was to continue at Bath. When Catherine knew this, her resolution was directly made. She spoke to Henry Tilney on the subject, regretting his brother's evident partiality for Miss Thorpe, and entreating him to make known her prior engagement. My brother does know it, was Henry's answer. Does he? Then why does he stay here? He made no reply, and was beginning to talk of something else, but she eagerly continued, Why did not you persuade him to go away? The longer he stays, the worse it will be for him at last. Pray advise him for his own sake and for everybody's sake to leave Bath directly. Absence will in time make him comfortable again, but he can have no hope here, and it is only staying to be miserable. Henry smiled and said, I am sure my brother would not wish to do that. Then you will persuade him to go away. Persuasion is not at command, but pardon me if I cannot even endeavour to persuade him. I, have to I myself have told him that Miss Thorpe is engaged. He knows what he is about, and must be his own master. No, he does not know what he is about, cried Catherine. He does not know the pain he is giving my brother. Not that James has ever told me so, but I am very sure that he is very uncomfortable. And you are sure it is my brother's doing? Yes, very sure. Is it my brother's attentions to Miss Thorpe? or Miss Thorpe's admission of them that gives the pain. Is not it the same thing? I think Mr. Morland would acknowledge a difference. No man is offended by another man's admiration of the woman he loves. It is the woman only who can make it a torment. Catherine blushed for her friend and said, Isabella is wrong, but I am sure she cannot mean to torment, for she is very much attached to my brother. She has been in love with him ever since they first met, and while my father's consent was uncertain, she fretted herself almost into a fever. You know she must be attached to him. I understand. She is in love with James and flirts with Frederick. Oh no, not flirts. A woman in love with one man cannot flirt with another. It is probable that she will neither love so well nor flirt so well as she might do either singly. The gentlemen must each give up a little. After a short pause, Catherine resumed with, Then you do not believe Isabella so very much attached to my brother? I can have no opinion on that subject. But what can your brother mean? If he knows her engagement, what can he mean by his behaviour? You are a very close questioner. Am I? I only ask what I want to be told. But do you only ask what I can be expected to tell? Yes, I think so, for you must know your brother's heart. 
My brother's heart, as you term it, on the present occasion, I assure you, I can only guess at. Well? Well, nay, if it is to be guessed work, let us all guess for ourselves. To be guided by second-hand conjecture is pitiful. The premises are before you. My brother is a lively and perhaps sometimes a thoughtless young man. He has had about a week's acquaintance with your friend, and he has known her engagement almost as long as he has known her. Well, said Catherine, after some moments' consideration, you may be able to guess at your brother's intentions from all this, but I am sure I cannot. But is not your father uncomfortable about it? Does not he want Captain Tilney to go away? Sure, if your father were to speak to him, he would go. My dear Miss Morland, said Henry, in this amiable solicitude for your brother's comfort, may you not be a little mistaken? Are you not carried a little too far? Would he thank you, either on his own account or Miss Thorpe's, for supposing that her affection, or at least her good behaviour, is only to be secured by her seeing nothing of Captain Tilney? Is he safe only in solitude, or is her heart constant to him only when unsolicited by anyone else? He cannot think this, and you may be sure that he would not have you think it. I will not say, do not be uneasy, because I know that you are so in this moment. But be as little uneasy as you can. You have no doubt of the mutual attachment of your brother and your friend. Depend upon it, therefore, that real jealousy never can exist between them. Depend upon it that no disagreement between them can be of any duration. Their hearts are open to each other, as neither heart can be to you. They know exactly what is required and what can be borne, and you may be certain that one will never tease the other beyond what is known to be pleasant. Perceiving her still to look doubtful and grave, he added, Though Frederick does not leave Bath with us, he will probably remain but a very short time, perhaps only a few days behind us. His leave of absence will soon expire, and he must return to his regiment. And what will then be their acquaintance? The mess room will drink Isabella Thorpe for a fortnight, and she will laugh with your brother over poor Tilney's passion for a month. Catherine would contend no longer against comfort. She had resisted its approaches during the whole length of a speech, but it now carried her captive. Henry Tilney must know best. She blamed herself for the extent of her fears, and resolved never to think so seriously on the subject again. Her resolution was supported by Isabella's behaviour in their parting interview. The Thorpes spent the last evening of Catherine's stay in Pulteney Street, and nothing passed between the lovers to excite her uneasiness or make her quit them in apprehension. James was in excellent spirits, and Isabella most engagingly placid. Her tenderness for her friend seemed rather the first feeling of her heart, but that at such a moment was allowable, and once she gave her lover a flat contradiction, and once she drew back her hand. But Catherine remembered Henry's instructions, and placed it all to judicious affection. The embraces, tears, and promises of the parting fair ones may be fancied. Northanger Abbey, Chapter the Twentieth Mr. and Mrs. Allen were sorry to lose their young friend, whose good humour and cheerfulness had made her a valuable companion, and in the promotion of whose enjoyment their own had been greatly increased. Her happiness in going with Miss Tilney, however, prevented their wishing it otherwise, and, as they were to remain only one more week in Bath themselves, her quitting them now would not long be felt. Mr. Allen attended her to Milsom Street, where she was to breakfast, and saw her seated with the kindest welcome among her new friends. But so great was her agitation in finding herself as one of the family, and so fearful was she of not doing exactly what was right, and of not being able to preserve their good opinion, that in the embarrassment of the first five minutes she could almost have wished to return with him to Pulteney Street. 
Miss Tilney's manners and Henry's smile soon did away some of her unpleasant feelings, but still she was far from being at ease. Nor could the incessant attentions of the general himself entirely reassure her. Nay, perverse as it seemed, she doubted whether she might not have felt less had she been less attended to. His anxiety for her comfort, his continual solicitations that she would eat, and his often expressed fears of her seeing nothing to her taste, though never in her life before had she beheld half such variety on a breakfast table, made it impossible for her to forget for a moment that she was a visitor. She felt utterly unworthy of such respect, and knew not how to reply to it. Her tranquillity was not improved by the general's impatience for the appearance of his eldest son, nor by the displeasure he expressed at his laziness when Captain Tilney at last came down. She was quite pained by the severity of his father's reproof, which seemed disproportionate to the offence, and much was her concern increased when she found herself the principal cause of the lecture, and that his tardiness was chiefly resented from being disrespectful to her. This was placing her in a very uncomfortable situation, and she felt great compassion for Captain Tilney, without being able to hope for his good will. He listened to his father in silence, and attempted not any defence, which confirmed her in fearing that the inquietude of his mind, on Isabella's account, might be keeping him long sleepless, have been the real cause of his rising late. It was the first time of her being decidedly in his company, and she had hoped to be now able to form her opinion of him. But she scarcely heard his voice while his father remained in the room, and even afterwards, so much were his spirits affected, she could distinguish nothing but these words in a whisper to Eleanor. How glad I shall be when you are all off. The bustle of going was not pleasant. The clock struck ten while the trunks were being carried down, and the general had fixed to be out of Milson Street by that hour. His greatcoat, instead of being brought for him to put on directly, was spread out in the curricle in which he was to accompany his son. The middle seat of the chaise was not drawn out, though there were three people to go in it, and his daughter's maid had so crowded it with parcels that Miss Morland would not have room to sit, and so much was he influenced by this apprehension when he handed her in, that she had some difficulty in saving her own new writing desk from being thrown out into the street. At last, however, the door was closed upon the three females, and they set off at the sober pace in which the handsome, highly fed four horses of a gentleman usually perform a journey of thirty miles. Such was the distance of Northanger from Bath, to be now divided into two equal stages. Catherine's spirits revived as they drove from the door, for with Miss Tilney she felt no restraint, and with the interest of a road entirely new to her, of an abbey before and a curricle behind, she caught the last view of Bath without any regret, and met with every milestone before she expected it. The tediousness of a two hours bait at Petit France, in which there was nothing to be done but to eat without being hungry, and loiter about without anything to see, next followed, and her admiration of the style in which they travelled, of the fashionable chaise and four, postillions handsomely liveried, rising so regularly in their stirrups, and numerous outriders properly mounted, sunk a little under this consequent inconvenience. Had their party been perfectly agreeable, the delay would have been nothing, but General Tilney, though so charming a man, seemed always a check upon his children's spirits, and scarcely anything was said but by himself. The observation of which, with his discontent at whatever the inn afforded, and his angry impatience at the waiters, made Catherine grow every moment more in awe of him, and appeared to lengthen the two hours into four. At last, however, the order of release was given, and much was Catherine then surprised by the general's proposal of her taking his place in his son's curricle for the rest of the journey. The day was fine, and he was anxious for her seeing as much of the country as possible. 
The remembrance of Mr. Allen's opinion respecting young men's open carriages made her blush at the mention of such a plan, and her first thought was to decline it. But her second was of greater deference for General Tilney's judgment. He could not propose anything improper for her, and in the course of a few minutes she found herself with Henry in the curricle as happy a being as ever existed. A very short trial convinced her that a curricle was the prettiest equipage in the world. The chaise and four wheeled off with some grandeur, to be sure, but it was a heavy and troublesome business, and she could not easily forget in having stopped two hours at Petit France. Half the time would have been enough for the curricle, and so nimbly were the light horses disposed to move that had not the general chosen to have his own carriage lead the way, they could have passed it with ease in half a minute. But the merit of the curricle did not all belong to the horses. Henry drove so well, so quietly, without making any disturbance, without parading to her or swearing at them, so different from the only gentleman coachman whom it was in her power to compare him with. And then his hat sat so well, and the innumerable capes of his greatcoat looked so becomingly important. To be driven by him, next to being dancing with him, was certainly the greatest happiness in the world. In addition to every other delight, she had now that of listening to her own praise, of being thanked, at least on his sister's account, for her kindness in thus becoming her visitor, of hearing it ranked as real friendship, and described as creating real gratitude. His sister, he said, was uncomfortably circumstanced. She had no female companion, and in the frequent absence of her father, was sometimes without any companion at all. But how can that be, said Catherine? Are you not with her? Northanger is not more than half my home. I have an establishment at my own house in Woodston, which is nearly twenty miles from my father's, and some of my time is necessarily spent there. How sorry you must be for that. I am always sorry to leave Eleanor. Yes, but besides your affection for her, you must be so fond of the Abbey. After being used to such a home as the Abbey, an ordinary parsonage house must be very disagreeable. He smiled and said, You have formed a very favourable idea of the Abbey. To be sure I have. Is it not a fine old place, just like what one reads about? And are you prepared to encounter all the horrors that a building such as what one reads about may produce? Have you a stout heart, nerves fit for sliding panels and tapestry? Oh yes, I do not think I should be easily frightened, because there would be so many people in the house. And besides, it has never been uninhabited and left deserted for years and then the family come back to it unawares without giving any notice, as generally happens. No, certainly, we shall not have to explore our way into a hall dimly lighted by the expiring embers of a wood fire, nor be obliged to spread our beds on the floor of a room without windows, doors, or furniture. But you must be aware that when a young lady, by whatever means, introduced into a dwelling of this kind... She is always lodged apart from the rest of the family. While they snugly repair to their own end of the house, she is formally conducted by Dorothy, the ancient housekeeper, up a different staircase and along many gloomy passages, into an apartment never used since some cousin of kin died in it about twenty years before. Can you stand such a ceremony as this? Will not your mind misgive you when you find yourself in this gloomy chamber, too lofty and extensive for you, with only the feeble rays of a single lamp to take in its size, its walls hung with tapestry exhibiting figures as large as life, and the bed of dark green stuff or purple velvet, presenting even a funereal appearance? Will not your heart sink within you? Oh, but this will not happen to me, I am sure. How dreadfully will you examine the furniture of your apartment, and what will you discern? Not tables, toilets, wardrobes, or drawers, 
but on one side perhaps the remains of a broken lute, on the other a ponderous chest which no efforts can open, and over the fireplace the portrait of some handsome warrior whose features will so incomprehensibly strike you that you will not be able to withdraw your eyes from it. Dorothy, meanwhile, no less struck by your appearance, gazes on you in great agitation and drops a few unintelligible hints. To raise your spirits, moreover, she gives you reason to suppose that the part of the abbey you inhabit is undoubtedly haunted and informs you that you will not have a single domestic within call. <laughs> With this parting cordial, she curtsies off. You listen to the sound of her receding footsteps as long as the last echo can reach you. And when, with fainting spirits, you attempt to fasten your door, you discover with an increased alarm that it has no lock. Oh, Mr. Tilney, how frightful! This is just like a book. But it cannot really happen to me. I am sure your housekeeper is not really Dorothy. Well, what then? Nothing further, perhaps, to alarm may occur the first night. After surmounting your unconquerable horror of the bed, you will retire to rest and get a few hours' unquiet slumber. But on the second, or at farthest the third night after your arrival, you will probably have a violent storm, Peals of thunder so loud as to seem to shake the edifice to its foundation will roll round the neighbouring mountains, and during the frightful gusts of wind which accompany it, you probably think you will discern, for your lamp is not extinguished, one part of the hanging more violently agitated than the rest. Unable, of course, to repress your curiosity in so favourable a moment for indulging it, you will instantly arise, and, throwing your dressing gown around you, proceed to examine this mystery. After a very short search, you will discover a division in the tapestry so artfully constructed as to defy the minutest inspection, and on opening it, a door will immediately appear, which door being only secured by massy bars and a padlock, you will, after a few efforts, succeed in opening, and with your lamp in your hand, will pass through into a small, vaulted room. No, indeed, I, I should be too frightened to do any such thing. What? Not when Dorothy has given you to understand that there is a secret subterraneous communication between your apartment and the chapel of St. Anthony, scarcely two miles off? Could you shrink from so simple an adventure? No, no, you will proceed into this small vaulted room, and through this into several others, without perceiving anything very remarkable in either. In one, perhaps, there may be a dagger. In another, a few drops of blood. And in a third, the remains of some instrument of torture. But there being nothing in all this out of the common way, and your lamp being nearly exhausted, you will return towards your own apartment. In repassing through the small vaulted room, however, your eyes will be attracted towards a large old-fashioned cabinet of ebony and gold, which, though narrowly examining the furniture before, you had passed unnoticed. Impelled by an irresistible presentiment, you will eagerly advance to it, unlock its folding doors, and search into every drawer, but for some time without discovering anything of importance, perhaps nothing but a considerable hoard of diamonds. At last, however, by touching a secret spring, an inner compartment will open, a roll of paper appears, you seize it, it contains many sheets of manuscript. You hasten with the precious treasure into your own chamber, but scarcely have you been able to decipher. O thou, whomsoever thou mayest be, into whose hands these memoirs of the wretched Matilda may fall, when your lamp suddenly expires in the socket and leaves you in total darkness. Oh, no, no, I do not say so. Well, go on. But Henry was much too amused by the interest he had raised to be able to carry it farther. He could no longer command solemnity either a subject or voice, and was obliged to entreat her to use her own fancy in the perusal of Matilda's woes. 
Catherine, recollecting herself, grew ashamed of her eagerness and began earnestly to assure him that her attention had been fixed without the smallest apprehension of really meeting with what he related. Miss Tilney, she was sure, would never put her into such a chamber as he had described. She was not at all afraid. As they drew near the end of their journey, her impatience for a sight of the abbey, for some time suspended by his conversation on subjects very different, returned in full force, and every bend in the road was expected with solemn awe to afford a glimpse of its massy walls of grey stone rising amidst a grove of ancient oaks with the last beams of the sun playing in beautiful splendour on its high gothic windows. But so low did the building stand that she found herself passing through the great gates of the lodge into the very grounds of Northanger without having discerned even an antique chimney. She knew not that she had any right to be surprised, but there was something in this mode of approach which she certainly had not expected. To pass between the lodges of a modern appearance, to find herself with such ease in the very precincts of the abbey, and driven so rapidly along a smooth level road of fine gravel, without obstacle, alarm or solemnity of any kind, struck her as odd and inconsistent. She was not long at leisure, however, for such considerations. A sudden scud of rain driving full in her face made it impossible for her to observe anything further and fixed all her thoughts on the welfare of her new straw bonnet. And she was actually under the abbey walls, was springing with Henry's assistance from the carriage, was beneath the shelter of the old porch, and had even passed on to the hall where her friend and the general were waiting to welcome her, without feeling one awful foreboding of future misery to herself, or one moment's suspicion of any past scenes of horror being acted within the solemn edifice. The breeze had not seemed to waft the size of the murderer to her. It had wafted nothing more than a thick, mizzling rain, and having given a good shake to her habit, she was ready to be shown into the common drawing-room, and capable of considering where she was. An abbey. Yes, it was delightful to really be in an abbey. But she doubted, as she looked around the room, whether anything within her observation would have given her the consciousness. The furniture was in all the profusion and elegance of modern taste. The fireplace where she had expected the ample and ponderous carving of former times was contracted to a rumford with slabs of plain though handsome marble and ornaments over it of the prettiest English china. The windows to which she looked with peculiar dependence from having heard the general talk of her, his preserving them in her, their gothic form with reverential care were yet less what her fancy had portrayed. To be sure, the pointed arch was preserved, the form of them was gothic, they might even be casements, but every pane was so large, so clear, so light. To an imagination which had hoped for the smallest divisions and the heaviest stonework, for painted glass, dirt and cobwebs, the difference was very distressing. The general, perceiving how her eye was employed, began to talk of the smallness of the room and simplicity of the furniture, where everything being for daily use pretended only to comfort and so on, flattering himself, however, that there were some apartments in the abbey not unworthy her notice, and was proceeding to mention the costly gilding of one in particular, when, taking out his watch, he stopped short to pronounce it with surprise within twenty minutes of five. This seemed the word of separation, and Catherine found herself hurried away by Miss Tilney in such a manner as convinced her that the strictest punctuality to the family hours would be expected at Northanger. Returning through the large and lofty hall, they ascended a broad staircase of shining oak, which, after many flights and many landing places, brought them along a long, wide gallery. On one side of it, were a range of doors, and it was lighted on the other by windows, which Catherine had only time to discover looked into a quadrangle, before Miss Tilney led the way into a chamber, and scarcely staying to hope she would find it comfortable, 
left her with an anxious entreaty that she would make as little alteration as possible in her dress. 